If you've heard the claim that the Quran is bursting with scientific miracles, congrats. You've stumbled upon one of Islamic apologetics' greatest hits. The pitch, the Quran reveals facts no 7th century Arab could have possibly known. Sounds pretty mind-blowing, right? But here's the catch, if the science proves it's divine, then the blunders prove the opposite, and that's where the whole argument crashes and burns. Take embryology, for instance. Muslims often point to Quran 23.12-14, claiming it describes the stages of embryonic development with knowledge far beyond its time. But hold on, about a thousand years before Muhammad, Aristotle wrote an entire book on embryology, laying out the stages in detail. Then Galen, a Greek scientist, came along 500 years before Muhammad and took it even further, explaining how bones and flesh develop. So Muhammad wasn't exactly breaking new ground here, he was just recycling old ideas. To make matters worse, the Quran's version isn't even accurate. It claims bones are formed first, then clothed with flesh, but Wrong. modern science shows bones and flesh develop at the same time. Far from miraculous, the Quran's take is both outdated and scientifically wrong. Compared to what Aristotle and Galen already knew, it looks downright primitive. Let's look at a few more claims. Muslims often argue that the Quran predicts the Big Bang in Surah 2130, which says, Have not those who disbelieve known that the heavens and the earth were of one piece and we parted them? And to top it off, they claim that this verse shows miraculous biological insight by adding, We made every living thing out of water. The claim, Muhammad could have known about the Big Bang or that water is essential for life, so the Quran must be from Allah. But as usual, just digging into the text shows otherwise. The verse actually says, Have not those who disbelieve known that the heavens and the earth were of one piece, then we parted them. So no, it's not talking about the Big Bang singularity. It's more like a remix of Genesis 1-6 where God separates the heavens and the earth. Nothing new. But if this was supposed to describe the Big Bang, it's a pretty terrible description. The Big Bang wasn't about a lump blowing up. There wasn't even matter yet and Earth formed billions of years after. As for the water bit, it's hardly miraculous to notice that life needs water, especially when you live in the desert. Plus, Aristotle recorded that Thales believed that the nature of all things is water, and Anaximander said that life came from the sea, so the idea that life depends on water was already known well before Muhammad. Another popular claim is that the Quran miraculously reveals the origins of iron, saying that it was sent down from the heavens in Surah 57.25. This would have been well before it was known that meteors containing iron fell to the earth. But here's the thing, this isn't exactly breaking news. The ancient Egyptians referred to iron as the metal of heaven, and the Babylonians used similar terms. In fact, all the elements on earth originally came from outer space, not just iron. So by singling out iron as some kind of special revelation, the Quran actually highlights its ignorance of basic scientific facts. Another popular argument is that the Quran contains miraculous geological insight about mountains. In 78.6-7, through 7, it calls mountains pegs, implying they have roots beneath the Earth's surface, a fact modern science has supposedly only recently confirmed. Even more impressive, some claim, is the Quran's assertion that these mountain roots stabilize the Earth, which sounds like a nod to plate tectonics. The conclusion, Muhammad must have had divine knowledge. But here's the reality. The idea that mountains stabilize the earth is flat out wrong. Mountains wrong. don't create stability. They're a result of tectonic instability. And sure, mountains do have roots, but the Quran wasn't exactly breaking new ground there either. The Bible mentioned mountain roots long before in Job 28.9, in Psalm 18.7, and Jonah 2.6. So this miraculous insight is neither revolutionary nor accurate. And the errors don't stop there. Let's talk about stars. In several places, the Quran describes stars as missiles used by Allah to chase away demons. In Surah 67.5, we read that the stars are missiles thrown at rebellious devils. And it's not just poetic language either. Early Muslims took this literary. Sahih al-Bakari, Volume 4, Chapter 3, explains that stars exist for three reasons. To decorate the sky, guide travelers, and act as missiles to hit devils. In modern science, we obviously know what we call shooting stars are just meteoroids burning up in the atmosphere. Now let's jump into Muhammad's ideas on human reproduction, and I'll try and keep it as PG as possible. In Surah 86, 5 through 7, the Quran claims that semen comes from between the loins and the chest bones. Last time I checked, semen is produced in the pelvis, not anywhere near the chest bones. This is just anatomy 101. But it gets a lot weirder in Sahih al-Bakari. 85 to 75. 
Muhammad is asked why a child looks like either the father or the mother, his answer, it depends on whose discharge happens first during sex. If a man's discharge comes first, the kid resembles him, and if the woman comes first, the child looks like her. Yikes. Modern genetics tells us that it's about a combination of the DNA of both parents, not a race to who comes first. And the fact that Muhammad claimed this gem of information came straight from the angel Gabriel, yeah, the same source as the Quran, makes it all the more concerning. Then there's the issue of sex determination. According to Sahih Muslim, Muhammad believed that an angel determines the sex of a baby only after the embryo is fully formed. But we know that sex is determined at the moment of fertilization based on chromosomes, not after the embryo has already taken shape. Again, this is basic biology that Muhammad got wrong, wrong. despite claiming divine revelation. Let's not forget Muhammad's questionable hygiene tips. In Sahih al-Bakari, he suggested that if a fly takes a dive into your drink, just dip it all the way in because apparently one wing carries the disease, but the other wing carries the cure. Oh, and don't forget the part where he promoted drinking camel urine as a cure for diseases in Sahih Muslim, because oh, nothing man. says miraculous revelation like downing a glass of camel pee. And then there's Muhammad's take on Adam. According to Sahih Bukhari, Adam was a whopping 60 cubits tall, that's about 90 feet. Muhammad even claimed that humans have been shrinking ever since Adam's time, but in paradise, we'll all be returning to our towering 90-foot glory. I think it goes without saying that there's absolutely zero evidence, no ancient records, no fossils, that humans were ever walking, talking skyscrapers. In the end, these so-called scientific miracles of the Quran fall apart under the light of modern understanding. What we really see are the limitations of a 7th century man, who is a bit on the quirky side, not a divine revelation. Honestly, calling these errors miracles is more of a joke than a convincing argument. So the next time a Muslim wants to argue with you that there's scientific miracles in the Quran, ask him how much camel pee he drank that morning. Repeat it again, very carefully. The scientific miracles argument in the Quran got debunked.